All right, friends, it is June 1st, and today we begin the book of Job, and we will be in Job for 13 days. Today we start chapters one through four. This is going to be an interesting uh, conversation we're going to have about this book. Let me begin by we reading, not weeding. I, I did that with my garden the other day, but reading Job chapters one through four. Uh, as we, we go through that, but let me read the introduction to the Wesley Study Bible on Job. There are in the book of Job many things hard to understand, writes John Wesley. The vast commentary on the book and the extraordinary diversity of those comments bear out Wesley's words. The cliche, the patience of Job, suggests one way the book has been heard. A deeply pious Job is afflicted, losing everything, but, but with exemplary fortitude maintains his faith in God and finds a rich reward at his trial's end. The, patient, the word patience comes from the King James translation of 511. The fact that the New Revised Standard Version translates that same word endurance suggests that patience may not be what Job is exactly about. Indeed, his so-called patience appears to last only two chapters out of a 42-chapter book. Others say that the book is finally about the nature of God. If written during the exile, 597 to 539 BC, a likely possibility, not definitely provable, the issue of God must have been an especially lively one. At the hands of their Babylonian captors, Israel lost land, temple, kings, priests, and sacrifice all at once. What possibly could God have in store for the nation now? Living hundreds of miles from their promised land in the Babylonian ghetto of Tel Aviv, see Ezekiel 3.15, deep questions of God's purpose and design must have echoed in their minds as they moved back and forth between hope and despair. In Job's angry struggles with his friends and in his confrontation with God, of, with the God of the whirlwind, the portrait of that God forms against the background of Job's demands for justice and truth as he understands them. In the speeches of God, the author offers a surprise to Job and his friends and to all who continue to read Job's story. So this is just an interesting book. Uh, and, and one of the questions will be is, what's the theology that we get out of this? Is, um, I'm going to suggest here in a minute that this probably is just a story, it was meant to be a story, not an actual historical person and because of the way it was written, but it was written uh, to try to understand certain things about the nature of God in the midst of calamity. So uh, we have to watch uh, some of the ways we may or may not draw certain theological conclusions from Job. So it is indeed an interesting book at times perplexing to read. So let's begin um, with chapter one, and we're going to go through chapter four today. Uh, so we get the introduction in chapter one, and the story begins in a once upon a time kind of way, uh, which suggests uh, to us that the story of Job is not intended to be historical. Uh, indeed, the setup seems to be uh, theoretical, it focuses on a sinless man who is perfect, morally perfect, um, and there's a crazy situation, absurd situation that begins the book in which God is forced to test a person he knows to be perfect. But what we get, of course, is this setting in order to press uh, for the, the points, the more abstract form of the questions of the book. And I think those questions concern God's justice versus the suffering of the righteous. Um, and what about the accessibility of wisdom and particularly knowing God? Uh, and we'll, we'll explore these more as we go through the book. Um, Job is presented as a prosperous, uh, uh, aristocratic type of guy from the land of Uz, which is an area which uh, is either equated with south of, of the land of Edom or perhaps with Aram, northeast of Israel, more toward the uh, land of Abraham. Uh, modern day Syria would be, would be a good uh, uh, 21st century correlation. Um, 
Job is not an Israelite. There's no apparent uh, at all need, uh, no apparent at all appeal to him being an Israelite, but he is God-fearing. He worships the God of Israel, um, and he is considered blameless and upright, one who fears God and turns away from evil. Um, he, uh, the description of, of the narrator, narrator's description of Job puts Job as, as a person uh, for, uh, about whom there is no one else like him on earth, right? So he is this unique, morally blameless person. Um, and in fact, uh, we are told that he is greatest of all the people of the East. You get a reference to his wealth, Job's great wealth, his great wisdom. Um, and in the ancient world, in this part of the world, men from the East are known to be wise. Think of Matthew and the wise men coming from the East. All right, so, um, so Job is the, per, uh, uh, not only is morally upright and wise, he also is the perfect family man. He's got uh, seven, He's got, uh, uh, you know, you've got seven and three, uh, which uh, are numbers that for the Bible are important numbers uh, that signify perfection. Um, he's got more sons than daughters, which in that world is better. And he's certainly got a lot of wealth. He's got all success. Certainly he has been blessed. Um, and in fact, um, he also, um, uh, offers offering for his adult children, which uh, in the ancient world, his adult children should be responsible for their own offerings, but he offers offerings for them just in case there's anything that they missed or neglected. So he's concerned about that. So he offers offerings for his children. Um, and um, the idea of cursing God, which we'll get to in a minute, is, is something that doesn't enter his mind um, because it is certainly central to the test that Job undergoes, and it's, antithesis, it's an antithesis to those who are morally upright and blameless. So in verse 6, the scene, uh, we get past the introduction, the scene switches to heaven, and the scene opens with one day. So again, here we're possibly getting story. Um, and it focuses attention on this particular moment. God is in the company of the council of heaven, of the heavenly beings. And among them is the Satan. Uh, some translations will say Satan with a capital S. But this in Hebrew is Hasatan, the Satan or the adversary, the accuser. Um, so not suggesting that this is the Satan that we read about later on and in the New Testament, but this is a member of the heavenly court who has come and whose job is to uh, test others, I suppose. Um, so uh, Satan proposes that Job should be tested. In fact, God starts the conversation, right? Have you considered my servant Job? And and the Satan says, the, the accuser says, well, uh, if, you know, it's easy for him to be so faithful because he's got everything. But if you test him, if you take certain things away, he probably won't be as faithful and upright and morally blameless as you think. And so God uh, seems to have no choice but to accept the Satan's challenge and agree to test Job and uh, so uh, it ultimately blames Job's suffering and loss on God who allows this to happen. So again, theologically, what do we do with this? Well, I think, again, we just need to be careful because this is a story. And right now, the scene is setting the stage for uh, larger uh, themes. So that's what this is doing. All right. Um, so you get the scene back on Earth where the tech test. The test is enacted, and in rapid succession, um, Job loses his wealth, and he loses his entire family, uh, other than his wife, and Job's reaction is to bless God, not to curse God, 
And Job seems very passive and accepting of what has happened. And so the first test has failed and uh, uh, Satan, uh, the Satan, the accuser ups the ante and says, well, what you need to do is test him physically. Uh, give something to him physically and, and uh, he, he will not pass that test. So uh, Job is inflicted with a horrible uh, skin condition, boils uh, that uh, are just awful, that he scrapes the sores, uh, you know, uh, probably with broken pottery. And uh, his wife is uh, wanting him to curse God. She says to him, curse God and die. Um, and by the way, cursing God results in death. So just curse God and die, Job. And some, some have seen his wife as a person being used by Satan in this endeavor. But it could also just be that this is a wife who obviously uh, is struggling with her own suffering in such loss and also seeing her husband suffer that just finally she is uh, ready to just curse God and be done with the whole thing. Uh, but Job refuses to do that. He says, shall we accept the good and not the bad from the Lord? So when we get into uh, chapter two, now we now get Job's three friends who come to us from places that are not identified. They come to mourn with Job, which is what you would do in that culture. And so they come to mourn with him and we're told they sit for seven days and no one says a thing because they see his suffering is very great. And this, of course, is a lesson for all of us that the most important thing in the midst of the suffering of others is to be present, not necessarily give advice, not necessarily tell folks, uh, give them words to try and make it all better, but just to be with them. So Job's friends do that. They sit with him for seven days. And Job finally in chapter three curses his existence. He doesn't curse God, but he curses his existence. He says he wished he would not have been born or if he had been born that he would have died quickly, that he would have died even nursing uh, at his mother's breast. So he curses his existence, but he does not curse God. So one of the things that happens now in chapter four is we get the dialogue. We get three cycles of dialogue between Job and his three friends. And what's very interesting is if you've got the scene of Job's three friends sitting around with him, and there's four of them, you don't get any trialogue, or I guess we call it a quadrilogue. You just get dialogue. One friend speaks at a time and Job responds to each friend one at a time, um, and uh, sometimes we got the same things that keep coming up. Sometimes it's different. So uh, we get these three friends whose names are Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And uh, the friends try various arguments to rationalize or to justify the condition in which Joe finds himself. But Job, at least up to this point, has, is rejecting uh, very strongly their assumptions and their reasoning. Um, and he insists there's no valid reason for his suffering. Uh, they're trying to make sense of his suffering. Uh, and uh, you've got all kinds of interesting loaded language. And so one of the other things that we need to reflect on here is Job... Uh, Job ha has no valid reason for his suffering. It's senseless. His friends are trying to make sense of it. And maybe sometimes we need to take the posture of Job is that there is suffering that is senseless. Um, and that that is okay to admit that and just to be with people. Uh, and we need to get rid of the pop theology that says everything happens for a reason. Well, I guess everything happens for a reason, but sometimes the reason is very uh, mundane or not really explainable. We don't always have to come up with a reason for why people are suffering. So uh, sometimes, again, more presence and less commentary is better. So in chapter four, we begin Eliphaz's first speech, and it will continue into chapter five. 
so he breaks the silence. He, he seems to speak softly to Job, reminding Job uh, of his own wisdom, how he has helped others in the past. Um, and yet now he seems to be able uh, be unable to offer his own wise words uh, in this situation. And uh, that uh, he should rely on what have been the traditional answers to the problem of suffering in general now applied to him. And uh, Job needs to fear God and have, an, have integrity. Uh, and if Job has that, he should be able to find the answers. Um, so uh, Eliphaz describes a vision he has, a revelatory vision, a dream, if you will, uh, and of course, we have seen how dreams in the ancient Near East are understood as divine communications. We've seen dreams. Jacob has dreams uh, in particular, and Joseph has dreams. And these are seen as revelatory. So um, he, uh, he talks about this dream, and he's told that there in this dream, no human can be more righteous than God. Well, that's true. Um, but he is suggesting that maybe because no one can be more righteous than God, that maybe Job has indeed done something. He's not as righteous as everyone thinks he is. God is more righteous than those. And maybe Job is suffering because he's not as righteous uh, as he should be. Um, and it's also impossible because God is uh, the most righteous to understand um, God's judgment and understand suffering. Humans are frail, uh, they're transient, they fall short of God's standard. And uh, so, you know, there's no comparison, there's no equal comparison between God and human beings. And by the way, this, this continued affirmation that God is above uh, humanity, God is greater than humanity, will be a theme that continues, particularly when we get God's speech out of the whirlwind and and of course, we'll get to that at the right time. So um, divine beings, uh, even divine beings in the heavenly court fall short. And um, of course, uh, which also uh, has some implications, I suppose, for the act of the Satan, the adversary in chapter one. But of course, Eliphaz is not supposed to know about this, right? Because he wasn't there. Uh, but we, the readers, know about it. So uh, we will continue in chapter five with Eliphaz's speech, where, where Eliphaz will begin uh, with implying uh, that Job has become a fool, that he has re rejected the teachings of the wise, and if he hadn't, he'd know what's going on. If he hadn't rejected it, he'd know what's going on. So that is where we are. We will continue tomorrow, chapters five through seven. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of this day, and thank you for your word, for the scriptures you have given to us, and for the book of Job, uh, which will at times be perplexing, which at times uh, we struggle with understanding uh, what it is trying to say, and even what we may take away from it. But uh, help us as we work through this book uh, to, to hear its words and may your spirit guide us in its interpretation in Jesus name. Amen. All right, friends. Hasta mañana.